Friday, Baylor College of Medicine and Friends of Baylor. First of all, I want you to notice that Lily's got her winter scarf on because it's cold in Texas. But that's not the only thing. I want to say hi to my sister who's freezing in New York. Hey, Janet. Anyway, uh, first I want to talk a little bit about the COVID epidemic in the world. China is now facing its uh, largest flare-up. And uh, Prime Minister Fumio Kishida of Japan keeps opening up Japan. So it's really fascinating to watch these two uh, Far East countries because China is still locked into this COVID, no zero COVID policy, which is really killing their economy. And Japan is opening up more and more and having more and more of an outbreak, but is willing to do it. And it's probably a good reason to do it. You can see Japan's going up, but their economy's uh, growing again. And so it's probably the right decision for them to make. And, and actually their mortality is stayed pretty low because they've been very effective at vaccinating the country. In the United States, cases and hospitalizations are beginning to rise. Uh, hospitalizations in particular in a few states, Arizona, Colorado, Nevada, and New Mexico, have really increased pretty dramatically, uh, almost 30%, even though the national numbers are a little bit lower. It's interesting though, uh, deaths due to coronavirus have continued to drop. We were running about 400 a day and we're down to 325 a day. So here's the CDC data on, on uh, cases, and you can see it's, it's plateaued and now beginning to rise. And the big concern is only 10% of patients or people who are eligible have had their uh, boosters updated, which is a real problem. It's setting up our country for outbreaks to come. I mentioned the hospitalizations nationally are only up 2.8%, but in those four states, almost 30% increase. And the real concern I have is the wastewater analysis from the CDC. You can see blue is where they're going down, red is where they're really increasing, orange is also increasing, and you can see most of the wastewater data continues to go up pretty significantly in the nation, which means over the next couple of weeks we're going to continue to see cases. Now, in our own region in Texas and in, in Harris County, you can see that the wastewater numbers are beginning to go up, and so we anticipate that we'll see more and more cases and hospitalizations. But we're still, in general here, pretty okay. Uh, the southeast United States is actually pretty low in COVID, even though it's expanding elsewhere. And I'll show you the map because it's really fascinating uh, in a second. But in our own uh, community, 2.8% of the cases are positive. Uh, we've, we're, we've been sort of low at 56 hospitalizations per day, which is quite good. But what I want to show you, which is a real, this is something new. This is something that new that has happened. If you look at the variant data, there's a group of four Omicron variants that account now for 54% of all of the infections. We've never seen this. Always it's been one variant at a time taking over. Now we have what's being called in by Nature magazine as a soup of variants. And between this soup of variants of Omicron and the original BA5, that accounts for almost you know 93% of all of the infections. But instead of being one, it's multiple. And that diversity is making it very difficult for us to figure out what's gonna happen. So you could imagine one of these taking off in one community. The problem is each of these may continue to cause multiple waves and it's getting very complicated. I think it's, it's getting very complicated. And the biggest problem is all these mutations are beginning to converge around the receptor binding domain and as you can see, there's this cluster that started at Omicron, and there's this group now that are emerging that share a lot of genetic mutations, mostly, as I said, in the receptor binding domain. So what does that mean? What that means is we've got a cluster of viruses out there getting set to uh, potentially infect a bunch of people who are no longer uh, resistant because they haven't gotten their booster shots. So uh, I anticipate we'll see a surge uh, of cases in the winter. now. We can, say, we can take something from this that's actually pretty interesting. The New England Journal just had a paper, uh, which is it's, it's actually pretty fascinating. In February of this year, Massachusetts rescinded their statewide masking requirement. So the, all, the, all the schools stopped uh, masking except for two uh, districts, Boston and Chelsea. They didn't stop their masking until June. So there was about, from February to June, there were only these two school districts that continued masking when all the rest of the schools in Massachusetts stopped. So they had a good comparison group. So before that event, the, the rate, COVID rates were exactly the same in every school system across Massachusetts. But because of the Boston and Chelsea delayed their, their mask rescind order to rescind the mask order, 
there were many fewer cases that developed in Boston and in Chelsea. And how much fewer? Uh, well, if you look at the 15 weeks where the policy was rescinded, though in those communities that stopped wearing masks, 50 cases per thousand students were increased. They had 11,000 cases, and 30% of the cases in the districts were during that time. You could argue, well, you know, maybe there was less risk in those Boston and, and Chelsea districts, but actually they were older buildings, worse ventilation, more students per classroom, and a higher percentage of low income uh, and uh, underrepresented minority uh, students. So what that supports, what that suggests is that masking in schools works. And as we face the potential for having outbreaks in schools, we now know it's really bad for kids to be distant learning, staying at home. So that's not a good idea. So what's an alternative? Masking works. And so I think we should take from that. This is the second sort of large school district study. There was one in North Carolina as well. That if we have outbreaks in communities, the best thing to do is mask students, but send them to school. There was also a really interesting paper that came out on long COVID. There's a cohort called the Innovative Support for Patients with SARS-CoV-2 Infections, called INSPIRE. It's a prospective cohort. It's a longitudinal multicenter study that follows patients who tested positive for COVID and compares them with a group that had similar symptoms but did not test positive for COVID. So they all had upper respiratory symptoms, but one group had COVID, the other group had some other uh, infection. And they've been following now for 6, 12, and 18 months. Uh, and these are the early uh, reports of the survey. This are the, you can see in, in the initial survey, uh, many patients had cardiovascular symptoms, constitutional symptoms, that's like achy wakies, GI, head and neck uh, symptoms, musculoskeletal, and lung and pulmonary symptoms. And that was, that was sort of the typical presentation of COVID. But over time, at their follow-up of 3, 6, 9, and 12 months, if there's a persistence of these uh, symptoms almost in 5 to 20 percent of patients. And that's as compared to patients who had other respiratory infections but not COVID. So this is another example of how long COVID is a significant complication and one of the reasons why we highly recommend people try to avoid getting it uh, and or at least be getting vaccinated to prevent it. Now, there's another thing we've been talking about is the reservoirs, the, the animal reservoirs. And there was a great study that came out of the University of Veterinary Medicine in Vienna. And it assembled all of the COVID data from, from all the world uh, reports. And as we've talked about, the minks, minks in particular are susceptible. The larger the circle, the more infections. So they were documented in minks and white-tailed deer and cats and dogs and lions and tigers. Oh, my. There was lots, lots of that. And the interesting thing is, uh, if you look at symptom symptomatic infections, white-tailed deer are almost always asymptomatic, uh, whereas dogs and cats and minks usually are symptomatic. So <laughs> stay away from white-tailed deer. They're all over the place. Now, last week we talked about RSV, and I want to show an interesting map because it really impacts being what we're seeing in the hospitals. Uh, so RSV usually is a, almost everyone gets it, especially under the age of two, but it usually starts in, in the southern regions in Mexico, moves up to the United States, and, and in, in general it happens pretty much uh, uh, in the fall. This year we had an early surge in April, and that was, uh, and we, we talked about this last week, a lot of susceptible kids, and it started early, but it starts in the southeast and then moves out to the rest of the country. This is the flu surveillance data from the CDC last week. You can see the southeast is highly infected, and you can see this week it's even worse. So tremendous outbreak of flu in the southeast United States. Now contrast to that, I showed you, I mentioned I was going to show you the COVID map, very low in the southeast United States, mostly in the, in the northeast and in those uh, Arizona and New Mexico, the areas I, I mentioned. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating because right now, I talked with our chair of pediatrics, uh, Dr. Shekhar Damian, and she said that one in six kids in the non-acute beds is infected with RSV or flu. And so that really shows you if a child now shows up with a fever and, and constitutional symptoms, it's more likely to be RSV and flu. I think as the winter proceeds and we begin to see the impact of COVID moving in later, we'll see more COVID infections. In the Northeast, it's different. That's why physicians have to be very aware of what is prevalent in their community. 
just to show you the flu season, it's really kind of dramatic. These are the years during the COVID pandemic when we had very little flu. This is, you can see 2021. This is this year. So a huge spike in outpatient activities and also being reflected in inpatient activities. So we'll, we'll probably talk a little bit more about flu because it's really uh, going to be bad flu season and we have some experts in flu coming up. So I want to end today with some shout outs. First of all, I want to recognize Dr. Anna Mandalakis, Chief of Global and Immigrant Health, who has recently been named, uh, has been given the award, the, the Clara Ludlow Medal for the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. This is named for the first woman member of the society and recognizes individuals who have made outstanding contributions to the field of tropical medicine. So congratulations, Dr. Mandalakis. Also, Dr. Jesus Vallejo, uh, Baylor Senior Associate Dean of Admissions, Diversity, Equity, and Multicultural Affairs, was honored by the Houston Health Museum as one of Houston's top healthcare professionals for dedicating their careers and their lives to addressing health inequity. So God, uh, congratulations to Dr. Vallejo. And my last shout out is <laughs> to Dr. Pooja Varshney from Dimmick County, our friends in Dimmick County. She's from Dimmick County and she's a 1966 graduate of Carrizo Springs High School and a 2004 graduate of Baylor College of Medicine where she also completed her pediatrics residency training. She's now in Austin uh, and on the faculty of Dell. And I can't wait to go visit Dimmick County and get a special tour uh, with Dr. Varshney. Anyway, have a great weekend and I can't wait to see you next week.